Hello, 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 and welcome to the big show. This is season two of Dim Lights and Stiff Drinks. This is the internationally famous podcast for Seattle area dive bars and drinking establishments. We're interested in those roadhouses, taverns, water and holes, long history, and nice CD backstory. And we get into the into the real history, the rich history of these epic drinking establishments, watering holes, taverns, juke joints, roadhouses. But what are we focused on in season two, right? We're doing the Pioneer well, Square we're bars. We're going to get there. Yeah, All we're right. going to get there. We're going to get there. The oldest so, bar in Seattle. And, and we're not just we're not just talking about these awesome old. Awesome, epic <laughs> drinking establishments <laughs> and dive bars in the confines of some cushy home uh, podcast recording studio. Oh no. No, no. We were coming to you live from the actual drinking establishments that we were talking about. This time around, we are in Georgetown, just south of Seattle, at Jules Mays. One of, one of, I'm, I'm not going to say the, but one of the oldest drinking establishments in the greater Seattle area. And How we're going to get into the awesome, epic, long ass well, history of this bar. Uh, refresh our listeners' memories with why we're going to these places. That's right. That's right. We're, See, in, we're on a hunt. That's right. Yeah, we talked about this is, this is season two. Season two has a, 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 a theme. We kicked off the season with a pretty cool theme of the oldest. Dive bars in Seattle, and we were on a hunt for the oldest. And then through through research, Brad, through your epic historical research, found out that's like, well, wait a second, there's a, quite a few establishments that are the claiming claim to be, to the, be oldest. the oldest. Yeah. And but which one really is? Which one is real? Well, only only one can be truly the oldest. Who, but it's it's complicated. It's not simply like, oh, well, that one's oldest. Uh, end of story. It's like, no, no. It's actually it's a little more complicated. It's kind than of that. complicated. Yeah. Well, yeah. one thing is simple though. There is one of the four that is not the oldest act of bar, Brad. Yeah. Well, we're going to yeah. get into that the next episode. So I think what we just talked about doing... Well, uh, no, I'm talking about the J&M. Oh, the it, J&M. Yeah, it, yeah, it's yeah. It's Gonzo. We were going to yeah. do an episode yeah, there. Yeah, and Yep. We didn't know. There are it some was of a, the oldest. It was not, a COVID the casualty. Oldest, but one of the oldest. Four, yep. Unfortunately, j and So let's do a quick, quick intros for everybody that's talking. All right. And then Brad will get into the history of the illustrious Jules Mays that we are at. I'm uh, Jay Dizzle. On my left is Stash Panda. Hello, everybody. Illustrious Bob Trombley on the mixing board. Producer extraordinaire. Hey, now. And. Louie. Sweet motherfucking Lou. Sweet motherfucking Lou. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right, good. So we were talking about. Oh, famous, and the house band. House, oh, shout out to the house yeah. band, Satan's Pilgrims, doing intro music. We'll see you hear a little bit more of them later in the podcast, too. Yeah, they come up around, too. So we talked about, like, the oldest, and it's like, well, it's not as easy as it sounds. So we're, there's a few of the oldest, some mm-hmm. of the oldest in Seattle, right? Yep. Well, and, what's the and, year on this one, Brad, supposedly? Well, we got episode, we're in episode three this season well, little, for Jules Mays. It's a little complicated because you have... Just give me a sorry. number. You can there is no there is no number. number. That's the whole because, point. Uh, he, which I'm going to get into. Well, no, no, We're stop. Don't get ahead, into but it Jules yet, but Mays started a bar before it became Jules and Mays. So that's what I mean. It's not as easy as just throwing a number at you. Well, I'm get into can that. you throw a number? Uh, 1889. 12. 592, there's a number for you. So even... I swear even, to God. Oh, you're, you're doing a spoiler alert, Lou. <laughs> yeah, okay. you're kind of... But even, you're jumping even, ahead. Eight, even 1889 is not a true, real, the number, right? Yeah. Right, Brad? Yeah. So why don't, you, why don't you tell us a little bit about the history? Yeah, so this place... So the story here obviously begins with the bar's namesake, Jules Mays. I think we did. Who was also known as the mayor of Georgetown. Jules Mays was a Belgian immigrant who immigrated to the United States in 1892. He worked as a bartender in a number of saloons throughout the South Seattle area before finally becoming a saloon owner himself when he purchased a South Seattle establishment known as the Maple Leaf Saloon. Where was that at? That was in the Rainier Valley area. Oh, okay. So South Seattle. Yeah, yeah? Yeah. In 1912, he sold that place so he could take over ownership of the Rainier Bar which was then located at Duwamish Avenue. And by the way, Duwamish Avenue is now known as Airport Way. Oh, okay. So this is on Airport Way. So, so his original bar Avenue. was just a few, uh, like a couple blocks down. And again, it was known as the Rainier Bar because it was near the Rainier Brewery. We're in Georgetown, by the way. Shout out. Yep. So during these early years, the Rainier Bar also had a meeting room in the back that briefly served as a 
bookie joint before being shut down <laughs> by the police. And for some local sports trivia for you, the Georgetown Merchants baseball team formed there in uh, 1920. Nice. Cool. During Prohibition, the Rainier Bar operated as the Rainier Soft Drink Saloon. So we've, we've got uh-huh. into this before. Everyone's throwing wait, up wait, air nudge, quotes. Nudge, nudge, nudge. Yeah. Basically, any drink and establishment that when Prohibition hit suddenly became a soft drink parlor, they were operating as a speakeasy. Right. And, you know, we've, we've covered a few of these places, yeah. In fact, the place was raided by the sheriff's office in 1927, and Jules Mays himself was arrested for selling medicinal drinks and health tonics with a high alcohol content. Well, wasn't that a, a wrap, a workaround, right, where yeah. Bartel's drugs served? Um, well, they, they served health tonics. Yeah, like health Coca-Cola. Tonics. Yeah. No, I'm thinking more... You could get it as a prescription, right? It, was, it wasn't a prescription. You didn't have to get a prescription for these health tonics. They were just sold, like, over the counter. And I'm thinking, um, like, Jägermeister. Like, I've always heard Jägermeister is, like, some old drink from native Germany that they used to drink medicinally, right? It tastes it exactly has, like fucking cough syrup. It tastes so, like NyQuil, kind right? of, right? <laughs> so that's what I imagine that they were selling when they got popped for these health tonics. I imagine right. they were very similar to... Uh, to like Jägermeister. Sounds like a conspiracy, right? So modern cough syrup is actually flavored after old school Jägermeister. Mm-hmm. Probably. Yes, I think it probably is. Yeah, you whatever know. herbs and... T- you guys ever drink Fernet? Yeah. That's like yeah. the bartender's oh, yeah. drink, the bartender's right. you know, the yeah. drink of drink. Yeah. I, I, it's disgusting. <laughs> is it kind of what we're oh, talking it, about? Like kind of yeah. black anise, licorice anise flavor. Anise yeah. flavored, yeah. We don't call it disgusting. We call it medicinal. We call it artisanal. Nice. Do you guys like Jägermeister? Do you guys like those kind of drinks, by the way? Yeah. When I was no, in high school. I, I like I've always been a fan like of Jägermeister. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I like black licorice. When I was in high school. It's like I like zero. It. Okay, I like black <laughs> licorice, but I, I know I'm in the minority. Yeah, I, I dig licorice, but not a, not a eh, Jäger, nah, nah. Yeah. You like yeah, black I, licorice? I do. And it's that's a fucking whole disgusting. Episode. So what's what's that Your drink disgusting. from Greece that's like black <laughs> licorice that you mix Uzo? with water? Uzo, or, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you guys don't you guys aren't down with Uzo I or hate Uzo. That is okay. fire water. Yeah. When I was in Turkey, there was a drink. It was a, their version of it was called Rocky. Oof. Yeah. <laughs> it, it I could only dun, imagine. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. Anyway, Uzo. in 1928, the business became known as Jules Maze. Finally and operated, operated as a restaurant and pool hall. So to answer your question, that's 1928 is when it became Jules Maze, but it was a little complicated because that same place was operating as a bar, but it wasn't known as Jules Maze previous to that. So that's why it was a little So what's the prohibition here again? 32? When it ended, when it was repealed yeah. in 1933. Okay. Yeah, it so started this- here in Washington State in 1916, national prohibition 1920, repealed nationally in 1933. So this is a... Once again, everything starts. And not only Seattle, but Washington. That's yeah. right. We were right. prohibition before. Yeah. But yeah, so after he got popped, he, he stopped with the soft drink, and then, then it became a pool hall. But pool halls back then were also, you know... Shady. They were also serving drinks on the DL. In 1934, after the repeal of prohibition, Jules Mays was granted a liquor permit, and his bar began to legally serve beer again. In 1936, the original location was damaged by a fire, and Mays relocated up the road a bit to where we are now. Uh, but after the fire in 1936, it moved, and it moved to its current location where we're sitting at now. So this site that we're on now, it's a Seattle historic site uh, that was built in 1898, and it was originally known as the Brick Store because it was a hardware store. Mm-hmm. And then it also served as a grocery store for a little bit. And then Jules Mays relocated here in 1936. Jules died a couple years later in 1939. However, it remained in the fam, May's family ownership for the next 58 years. I think his wife ran it for a while, followed by one of his nephews. In 1988, it was purchased by June Espeland and her son Jay, and it operated as Jules May's Saloon and Eatery. It was then sold in 2004 to Vanessa and John Lamaster, who did some... They subs- owned another bar, didn't they? They may have. I'm not, I'm not 100% sure on that, but it's entirely possible. Okay. Yeah. Continue. So they did some substantial remodeling, and they ran Jules Maze here until early 2020 when it closed down due to COVID. Initially, the word on the street was that this was permanently being closed down. Right. 
Uh, That's what I heard too. Yeah, and I remember that. I thought it was, yeah. Yeah, it received a lot of press. There was a lot of commiserating about it on social media. A lot of people were bummed out about it. But at kind of the 11th hour, it was purchased by a former patron, and I hope I'm pronouncing her name right, Rache Hemelgam. Okay. Uh, the first name is spelled R-A-C-H-E, so I assume it's Rache. Reopened it in January of 2021. Thank you, Rache. Yeah, thank you. So since taking ownership, Hemelgam has remained dedicated to preserving its original historic character and charm, and for that we all thank her. Looking around the bar's rich history and original architecture can be seen in everything from its vaulted ceilings in the uh, front room, and if you take a close look, it has the original 20-foot wooden bar that was from the original location that they brought with them. And if you look at the bar closely, you can see divots in the wood from where people's arms have rested over the decades. And I was hundred years it. worth of elbow action yeah. on that motherfucker. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I always love seeing that like physical history where you can see it. It's kind of like at Daryl's when we were put at Daryl's. You can see grooves around the pool table yeah. from where people over the decades have been sh- shooting pool, and it just kind of like formed a groove. There's also at Daryl's a payphone that I don't think it's in operating order anymore, but it's still there on the wall. And there's like footprints that have been grooved in from like decades of people just standing there talking uh, on the talks, phone. Yeah, talking That's with cool. the bookies. I, I talking took yeah. some yeah. picture of, pictures of that. Did you? So we'll, That's pretty we'll cool. put them up on the gram. Yeah. So I always love seeing that. Apologies if you're going to get into this already, but another interesting aspect uh, of this bar, and I don't think it's working anymore, but they originally had a running water spittoon trough at the bar, which I don't think is working yeah. anymore. But it was up until, I think, like the early 2000s or something, continuing to run water flowing through a little gully at the bottom oh, of the really? bar there to act as a spittoon, which is For pretty, what? That's pretty awesome. It's, it's basically a spittoon. Oh, so, uh, so for people to spit in it? Exactly. And, yeah. it, and it's got water constantly flowing through Ding. it. So, you know, it's nice and clean. It's this like is, nowadays we would push boats right? so of sushi on that. And back in exactly. the day, you spit in it. That's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yep. <laughs> well, I mean, spittoons were a thing. Classy. This is just like a next I'm level sure, spittoon. I'm sure Seattle yeah. people are walking into the bar going, oh, this place is nice. And Oh, look, a little sushi boat trough. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> my dragon roll. Yeah. Can I have a loogie roll, please? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, people are probably dumping their cigarettes in there and stuff. Not, sure. yeah, not, not, sure running, like not running any longer for, I think, Maybe. very obvious probably reasons. Probably got clogged yeah. after yeah. decades of people throwing who knows what who in there. Knows what exactly. Or I like to think they probably just emptied it out at the end of the night and it was the same shit that kept getting browner and browner as the night went on, right? Yeah, it was probably nasty. That was probably not a job you wanted to do, to be the spittoon cleaner. It's probably left for the dishwasher. I but don't anyway. know. It sounds like a good money-making opportunity. I'd be like, well, who it, wants to put in a buck to watch me drink a cup of the uh, oh, trough? Well, I would put in a buck to watch you, Lou, well, drink I'd, a cup of that. I'd, I'd put in a buck. bucks that night. <laughs> way, way back in the day, they'd get kids. So you get kids to come in and do those, the, you know, the spittoon rounds, you know, clean out the spittoons and stuff. And taverns. Ah, what a nasty sure. job. Yeah, you know, five cents an hour or whatever. Yeah. Up Go there with right. chamber pots, right? Beats exactly. The bedpan gig I had in high school. <laughs> oh. I'd much rather than cleaning out spittoons. <laughs> and on that note. Yeah. On that note. So that's basically <laughs> the history of Jules Maze. Nice. Over 100 years. and um, So yeah, so the next episode, we were originally going to record at the J&M, but they're closed indefinitely. So we're going to go to a neutral location. I think we were deciding maybe the zoo. We've been there before. Yeah, previous So we can location. announce, like, who really is the oldest Seattle bar. We kind of wanted to pick a neutral location mm-hmm. out of respect mm-hmm. for all the places. And, uh, you know, we're going to reveal our findings. And we've and, got a couple uh, places from season one that we talked about wanting to revisit because there was more we wanted to unpack, right? And the zoo right. had the chest. Yes. We're supposed to get some more, you know, download on... The uh, Derelict League the of The Derelict baseball. League. And all, there's uh, all yeah. sorts to, of stuff. can't wait we gotta, to dive in that chest. There, there's like that three, was, four, five yeah. episodes of content from that yeah. bar just, just alone. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Great place to go back. All right, cool. So we're back with round two. I think we're going to get into what you're drinking, mm-hmm. right? But I'm going to have to actually rewind it a little bit and talk about what I was drinking before we took a break. 
Now I'm on round two of the beverages, and we'll get into that. Yours but, looks like strawberry lemonade. Well, it does. It does. We're going to get into that. We're going to yeah, unpack I was, that I was one. intrigued by that as yeah, well. Yeah, so th- there's, there's, there's lots of cool shit to talk about what I'm drinking right now. Prior to that, though, uh, you know, so, like, what's on tap here at Jules Mayer's? And short answer to that is it's fairly typical to a lot of the dive bars we've been to, right? There is a, 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 a staple, like Rainier, uh, on draft, God bless him, but a fucking cool ass pole handle for Rainier that looks old yeah, school, and yeah. it's got the little I Rainier like that bottle that's actually like a costume of somebody running, like the running the, of the Rainiers, like the, like the commercial, right? Yeah, that's a, like a, there's a little uh, 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 icon of that on the top, top of the pole handle. Yeah, oh, that's cool. And I the didn't old school that. Rainier logo across the side, very very fucking yeah, cool. Yeah, that caught I my eye. Really picture cool. of that. Uh, none of the crappy stuff that you would typically expect, no Coors or Miller or anything like that. Uh, but, you know, again, this is a Seattle dive bar, so it's going to have a, a pretty cool selection of beer. But we are in Georgetown, so just like every Georgetown dive bar that we've been to, both this season and previous seasons, they, they have a good selection of Georgetown brewery beers mm-hmm. on tap, which is fantastic. Manny's so, and Bodie. Ma- Manny's and Bodie, Bodie right? Yep, so, yep. Again, we, we sometimes we kind of bag on and Manny's Lucille. and Bodie's, right? Because it's like, well, shit, it's like everywhere. It's like, but oh it's my good. God. But they're still but it's solid good. beers. And, it's just like Mac and, and Jack's. Like it, it's literally it's like better. two blocks like away. That better. shit is brewed, right? So yeah, that's yeah. true. That, you know, kudos to them. Yeah. But what I had before was I, I went a little non-local. And by my standards, non-local means it's brewed in Oregon <laughs> instead of Washington, right? <laughs> so, but still, one of my favorite breweries. i got a shout-out, Nikasi. Uh, you don't yeah. see Nikasi's on Ooh, track yeah, very often. That's what I got. The Super Haze, what yes. is it called? Uh, exactly. Hazy IPA from Ninkasi. You don't see Ninkasi on draft. They very always often. make solid beers. Always. Yeah, and I've never seen the Ninkasi Hazy on draft here in Seattle. So it'll get you there. Their stuff's all high octane. Yeah. What's the it's Slayer, great. their oh, winter yeah. beer? Slayer? Yeah. Yeah. Slayer. Like winter beer, yeah. yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah, Ninkasi has, do- has all sorts of cool heavy metal references. They do a collab with the Deftones. They have Slayer, which actually is licensed by Slayer to use like the font cool. and shit of the of Oh, is it licensed by the group? Oh, yeah. Cool. I would think like, it would have oh, to be. Yeah, for yeah, sure. They got they got permission, right, to call Slayer. Same thing with the. They have a couple of beers with Deftones collab. They have a, a couple of other heavy metal bands that they do collabs with and, and like coordinate with the bands and yeah. stuff. Uh, so yeah, pretty. And they're pretty great cool. beers on top of it. Oh yeah, all of them uh, amazing. Even some of their weird shit like uh, Voodoo Donut kind of beers and stuff. I've of that. had that. Yeah, but yeah, can't remember for sure. what it tasted. So like that's before. what I did first round, but second round made some observation. It like doesn't even look like it's. Uh, like a beer at all. It's, it's a pint a, glass a full of raspberry lemonade. It looks or like it looks raspberry like cran- lemonade. It could even right. be like cranberry or yeah, juice it could or be something. Cranberry juice. Refreshing, nonetheless. <laughs> well, don't hold us in suspense. <laughs> what are you drinking here? Oh, Jeremy's yeah. going to go to his notes. I'm, I'll tell you what he's drinking. It tastes like fucking. Uh, Summer? No, like a La Croix. Oh, really? Yeah. Is that hibiscus? So. I, that that the one of the reasons I ordered I it is a because I like it and I knew I would like it so I ordered it. But b I have never seen anything like this on draft at a dive bar. It is Sea Pine Brewery, Ooh. which is Ooh, in nice. Soto. Oh, it's yeah. a sour. It's a goss sour. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. I can or, taste or it. Or goze. You know, there's still ah. debate about the fucking delicious. And you right? can taste the raspberry. Two different, you know. Salty raspberry. A bunch of people told me, like, oh, no, no, it's actually pronounced blah, blah, blah. And, like, and then, you know, somebody else is like, oh, no, no, they're wrong. It's actually pronounced. Anyway, I think it's a goss. Somebody say ghost. Somebody say gauze. Eh, you know, goss. Whatever. I say I goose. Like goose, exactly. Some say, oh, it's actually pronounced goose. What? I say goss. You can, you can say whatever the fuck you want. <laughs> but it's a goss sour, which, again, I've never seen a beer like that, a beer style like that at the dive. So that's cool. I like sours. I like Goss style beers. Yeah, I need to have another. And it's fucking good. It took me yeah. I'm a, a raspberry from so Seapine. It, it's a beer. It is a beer. Yeah, yeah. It's brewed just like a beer. It's a little, you know, a little bit different. It's a sour, so it's got a, a very unique strain of yeast. They typically have a much longer fermentation time than like a typical ale or a lager. So it's low. But not always. Right? And is a sour um, is it like what? a three? Something? Usually, Usually but this one's ABVs. not. This one's like six. Oh what? wow, yeah. that's like twice. That's like a double. Yeah, uh, some gosses and sours are lower uh, ABV, three, three yeah. but yeah. a lot of modern interpretations of that style, like especially with other Belgian style beers, for example, 
we, in our American ingenuity, have figured out to get maximum alcohol content. <laughs> <laughs> From every type of beer imaginable. Exactly. So even a, even a style that traditionally had lower ABV, fuck, we'll yeah, like that up to totally six. Yeah, that's totally like a, a teenager drink, girl drink. And it goes down like, smooth. It goes down yeah. smooth. It and does go down six. smooth. But no, I wouldn't, awesome. I wouldn't call it a chick's drink. I don't think it's like a, well, like it's like a Mike's Hard Lemonade. Some of or a c- ciders these days, it's, it's like same thing. It's like smooth, easy drink. It goes down easy. And then you look at the in. bottle and you're like, 7%. Holy shit. Yeah. And you're seeing double. And are sours, are those Belgian in, or, in origin? Well, like, I, I think they, there's some debate over that. They remind me of, of the, the Belgian The Belgians style. would say, yeah, we invented that, right? And a lot of the sours you know, trace their lineage or they give homage to the Belgians, right? Okay. But there are other sour-style beers that came out, even like American-style sour beers. Okay. And like, remember a couple of episodes ago we were talking about the steamer style beers, mm-hmm. right? And like yep. your steam, stuff like that. Some of those, uh, some of those styles of pre-prohibition and prohibition style beers were pretty fucking sour. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, because of the way they were, the way they're handled, they were sure. brewed like super fast, super cheap, get them out to the... You know what's cool is though, like that is unique. Like we just went to the beer festival and we just had 33 different beers amongst the three of us. Yeah. I never At tasted least. anything that looked like that. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. There, there were a few sours on tap. They were cheating you. And um, there's a whole over the fucking sidetrack we could get into for like milkshake beers and smoothie Let's get beers. Let's real quick. Oh, my God. We just uh, went to the Washington Brewers Festival, Father's Day Festival. It's Friday, Saturday, Sunday night. We a go Friday night. for the podcast crew for some Yeah, it's, we've been doing it for, what, 15 years? There were two years it was shut down for COVID, and there was one year where we had a couple things going on, couldn't make it, maybe one or two, but yeah. We've and it started out as a Father's Day thing. Like, our wives, for Father's Day as a gift, like, sent us all to the beer festival, like, bought our tickets and stuff. Well, yeah, that's okay, where it started. I guess I'll go. <laughs> yeah. If you twist my arm. And for the last 15 and, years, yeah, when they a asked me, what since. do you want to do for Father's Day, is I want you guys to dr- drive us to and pick us up from the beer <laughs> festival. <laughs> yeah, they're a designated drivers. All I want for Father's Day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Uber. so we went this past Friday for our 15th Yeah, and it was shut, year. It shut down for the two years before, so this was the first Brewers Festival back. Yeah. Jeremy, did you see any trends? I saw it as a more balanced thing. There wasn't a new thing. It was like a yeah. little bit of everything in the past. Like there were the whiskey barrel beers, and there were the fruit yep. beers, and there were the farmhouse beers, and porters, and IPAs, and... Yeah, for sure. And like every year we've gone to the beer fest, we all kind of talk amongst ourselves like, oh, what's the kind of the, the style of this year's festival, right? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it was like some crazy, like ridiculously ultra hoppy. Uh, yeah, like how hoppy could the IPAs get? Right, like cre- crazy hoppy IPAs and stuff like that. And like you, like Lou said, some years would go back and there was like you know porters and like uh, yeah. uh, smoky beers were hot for a while and stuff. But yeah, I think I think Lou's right. It's, it's, it was almost like a resurgence of some of the classic styles that were in. You know, well covered in it. So, lots, which was good to see. I enjoyed that part for of it. sure. For sure, lots of lots of breweries had the IPAs, like traditional standard IPAs. We saw a lot of barrel aged. Yeah, which is, I mean, fucking, I love that shit, right? So I'm like, oh yeah. So and, uh, and bang for your buck, sometimes it's oh like fourteen percent. What oh, was yeah. that when we had a midnight murder? And midnight it was 14.1%. murder. Point one percent. Yeah, it was almost 14%. like hard alcohol territory. Yeah. Well, and the other thing I noticed, kind of a trend, was IPAs are now splintering off into all the different styles. Mm-hmm. So you had West Coast IPAs, New England mm-hmm. IPAs, Hazies, you know, all the different kinds of IPAs yeah, they have right now. Popular Citrus, for sure. yep. Yeah. yeah, for sure. So it's interesting to see that kind of like evolve. You see all these different styles forming. The coolest thing I loved about this year's Washington Brewers Association Beer Festival, trademark registered, copyright. Friends of the show. There was, there was a lot of breweries that I had never even heard of before. Yeah, and every time you go there, you're gonna see a couple of those because yep. that's it's kind of cool to see like some startup little nano brewery or whatever for show whatever. Absolutely. But there was a lot of those this year. Like, yeah. And I specifically tried to like talk with some of these guys like, hey, I, I never heard of your brewery. Is this yeah. this your first show? Like, oh yeah, we just opened like last month, and this is our like our first major show and stuff like. Right. There were a lot of those, which yeah. is pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Yeah, and I took some pictures, so I got a couple names of some beers that we might have drank. Mm-hmm. There was the, from Flying Lion, they had the Lenny Curly Mosaic Pale. Oh, yeah, I remember that one. Yep. And they had the Apricot, yeah, we like to potty. Um, <laughs> apricot Ale. 
There were some pretty epic beer names this year, too. Yeah. 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 Very, very, uh, very some creative. creative stuff. All the, the breweries have really upped to their naming game this year. And yeah. they were all unique beers that you only get there, the, uh, including the Velvet Uppercut, Belgian Strong, 9%. Mm hmm. <laughs> yep. And then um, we had Bosque Brewing. What was that hazy we got? And I think it was like a, a raspberry something, something like milkshake hazy. We were talking about milkshake mm. style earlier. Pike had a raspberry Hefeweizen that was pretty good. It wasn't that. There was another one. But, but we also went to Dix. Dix. Went to Dix. Yep. Yeah, Lou, guess what guys. I found in my wallet, you son of a bitch. Bunch of dicks. Uh, oh, the uh, yeah, stickers they handed so out. So Lou, always being, the, always being the joker, he got a bunch of Dick's stickers from Dick's Brewing with all these double entendres. And he was like <laughs> doing pickpocket style, but instead of taking something, he was leaving these stickers in our wallets. That's right. And, and I found one the next day. I was at the grocery store. Sec- you handed it in as cash, and it was like, I want Dick's oh. sticker. Legal tender. So they had yeah. three. They had the orange <laughs> juice jewels. The orange juice jewels. Orange juice jewels, and they had the cream stout, and they had the silver mullet, which was like their version silver of mullet. Budweiser, right? Mm, okay. Yeah. Okay. Nice. And yeah. then uh, Heathen Brewing, which was like metal. Heathen? They had the Pagani Italian style Pilsner, and my favorite name of the festival, the Merchant of Menace IPA. <laughs> the Merchant right? of Menace. They had a raspberry rhubarb, tiki time, tribal jam, went in stout, add peanut butter. Uh, I do remember that. I, was I didn't get that one, but I had a taste when, when you guys stout, got it. Add peanut butter. You didn't get it? No. When in stout? Come on, Brad. When in stout. I know. Add, it. You didn't, add the peanut butter. It? Still didn't oh, get it. Okay. All right. I apologize. So you mentioned a couple of uh, heavy metal themed breweries. There was quite a few, Heathen being one of them, but there was also heavy metal brewing. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And we got, yeah. uh, I think we got a... You got a picture of that. Like an IPA from them that was Well, do you remember the delicious. tap handle for that? It was like yeah. some figure playing a <laughs> playing B guitar. His head on fire. It was a great a flying tap handle. <laughs> yeah, I'll post that bit. That was the that best was tap handle. That was a great thing. one. So, yeah, recap of the Washington Brewers Festival. We might do that every year. In fact, we'd like to do one. We will be doing that every year. We'd like to do one live on site. But broadcast. Yeah, Bob, maybe, maybe something live on site. Maybe a stick because We're it's get us one of those. drinking beers for four hours while Bob protects the equipment somewhere. <laughs> I may or may not be nibbling on psychedelic mushrooms. Just coming back drunker and drunker and bomb. We'll yeah. get like a what GoPro and attach it to your head and we'll just like turn it on and let Lou I do go have a, I do have a GoPro. hour and a half. Do. Oh, do you? And that, that Benny Hill thing. That's I see an idea And that's it. And we'll, we'll have to speed it like up it. if we need to to get it in a one hour episode. But yeah, nice. that's it. Yep. I like it. Yeah. Right. Let's do it. Let's chop it up. We should probably start talking to him like now be before later to kind of like set things up because that's probably one of those things you got to like set up way ahead of time but i bet if we talk to him or we I just bet we can, uh, sneak that shit in and just do it gorilla style gorilla just set up one of those picnic tables that got set up yeah well i mean what are they gonna do what we'll are they gonna do cast up yeah. into the point where we're running for the parking lot <laughs> 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 thanks for joining we'll, we'll see you next time nice Get All right, well, I, I think that's a plan for uh, next summer then. <laughs> I like it. Right with that. Oh, so, so I talked, we, we just, thanks for stealing my beer, just finished what, what I was drinking. Brad, you are done, but I what just finished, were you drinking? I had a point break. Mm-hmm. And I don't know anything about them. That's why I got it, actually, because it wasn't something I recognized. And I like getting okay. something off the beaten path. And uh, it, was a, uh, it was a pale and it was really, really good because it had a nice little hoppy flavor to it, but not like IPA hoppy, just nice balanced flavor. Nice. Which I always appreciate. Cool. All right, uh, so Lou. Hi, Jamie on the rocks. You want to talk about where we're at? Jeez. Oh, wait, you're the host. <laughs> what are we doing? All right. So we're done with what you're drinking. That's fine. So, uh, and I made a comment before. We, we talked about how we're in Georgetown. We've done a couple of episodes from Georgetown and got into a little bit of history of Georgetown. But I, I, I love, I just got to say, man, I love this fucking neighborhood. This is kind of, to me, this is the heart of Georgetown, even though there are yeah. other, like, areas that are kind of, like, quote-unquote mainstreamy for Georgetown. To me, this is it, right? 
uh, airport way bleeding into, <laughs> into Georgetown is, and there's just some great, great restaurants along the street, some great breweries, Georgetown Breweries, just a couple of blocks up the street, Jules Mays that we're at now, a yeah. couple of other awesome uh, dive bar places that we'll probably visit in some future episodes, like literally half a block near, practically next door, so I just love this neighborhood. Oh yeah, totally, and you're right on the theater road in terms of where we're at, like we're riding parallel to I-5. Yep. It's that, yeah. it's that road you take when I-5 is too jammed up, maybe you want yeah, can to... You, can you imagine this place out? before I-5 was built? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right, like way happened. out in the fucking boonies. When originally right? Georgetown was its own little town. <laughs> totally, yeah. It wasn't before it was annexed by uh, like Seattle. a thousand people. Oh. Well, and it was a company town owned by the Rainier, Rainier Brewery. Brewery. The guy that right. ran the Rainier Brewery was also the mayor of Georgetown. No, it was a company town. So you didn't get it, but it was like it was a partying, crazy, off the hook. Everybody had town. script. Yeah, yeah. We talked about yeah, it in, in the <laughs> Slims episode, and that Georgetown yeah. actually only became a town because Seattle in 1905, even before 1910, started talking about local prohibition. Yeah, and they were the sixth largest beer producing district in the world at that time. So yeah. they were like, no, 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 no. So they made themselves a city. Yeah, in order to get. Uh, yeah. Shield themselves. Get some yeah. distance from Seattle. And then when yeah. they lost their, when they gave up on that crazy idea, yeah. Georgetown so said, we can join forces. George Georgetown basically gerrymanned themselves. No, they just uh, took care of themselves. All right, good for them. Yeah. And so... Uh, All right, let's do a quick outro All right. All right. as a host. So we, we are wrapping it up for episode, what are we on, three, four? This is episode, four? season two, episode three. Okay, there we go. <laughs> episode three and like you said brad we've got another episode coming up where we're going to recap seattle's oldest bars maybe we're going to do the big reveal yeah i don't want to say like crown a king because we kind of are in a way but you know there is a winner there is a clear winner before it's it's more complicated yeah and we'll get into that gotta tune in and figure out what the hell's going on but thanks for listening uh i'm jeremy brad lou bob until next time cheers Cheers, adios cheers everybody